<laughs> so, um, the next uh, third speaker in the session is Monique Simon from uh, South Africa. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon. So, I'm going to talk to you guys about school modularity and climate in under amphibians. This work is done with my advisor, Gabriel Mahoy, at the University of St. Paul. So, um, when we're talking about integration and modularity, we're actually dealing with complex systems composed of several elements, which are the circles here. And when, you put, when you're talking about integration, you're actually focusing on the relationships among these elements. And when you're talking about modularity, you're focusing on the semi-independence that you might have between groups of these elements. So this figure here is showing uh, different levels of modularity integration. And my work is actually concerned with population level integration, because we measure several individuals. So we can deal with genetic modularity, which is related with co-inheritance, and functional modularity, which might be related with performance selection. And also, since I compare species, I'm actually dealing with a comparative level, which I can infer about evolutionary modularity. So I'm working with uh, neuro amphibians, and they're a very cool system, because they have a unique difference in development. So this work uh, was released uh, last year. I was really happy with it because it shows that uh, neurons have a striking difference from other tetrapods in the bone derivation, embryonic bone derivation. So the other, other vertebrates have bones derived from uh, the mesoderm in gray and bones derived from cranial neural crest. But in anurans, here represented by Shinobis, you have a quite striking change in which virtually all bones are derived from cranial neural crest streams. So the mandibular stream, eoid stream, and brachial stream, here represented in the vibrio. So uh, the author suggested that these striking differences is actually related to the extreme metamorphosis that you have in anurans amphibians. So we decided to study modularity in toads of the Hinalgrunulosa species group. So here are the toads. Um, they are composed of 13 species, but we actually work with 11 of them. And uh, we had to scan all the specimens. So here are a representative of the specimens. We included an outgroup, which is Hinalonogatifra. And you can see that you have quite some variation in their skulls. So what we did, I scanned around 1,100 specimens for these uh, 12 species. And we place 3D landmarks in the 3D volumes, represented by the dots, and we extract 21 linear distances from these uh, landmarks. And this, this complex system of bones is represented as phenotypic variance, covariance, and correlation matrices. So um, in this presentation, I'm only focuses on matrices with no size. So the first question we asked was, are the relations among skull bones similar across the toad species? So to answer this, we use a method called random skewers, in which you simulate random vectors in a pair of species matrices, and we compute the mean uh, correlation between their response to selection. So we actually measure similarity in response to selection, random selection. So here are the species. This is for covariance matrices, this is for uh, correlation matrices, and you can see that we have a very high similarity across species and uh, covariance and correlation patterns. This is the outgroup, it's a little less similar, but still above 0.8. So we can't say that we have P-matrix stability in toad skulls. Okay, so but what's structuring this uh, variation pattern? So are the relations among skull bones structured by development or function? And this is an excellent group to separate these two because I could, could construct non-overlapping modularity hypothesis. So this is not possible with mammals, for instance. So um, I created a developmental modularity hypothesis based on the cranial neural crest strings, bone that I derives from these different uh, neural crest strings. A hormonal hypothesis, which is actually based on newts, because we don't have enough information for endurance which you have uh, tyrexine hormone sensitive bones and tyrexine hormone unsensitive bones in different groups. This is related to metamorphosis. And I also, I also constructed a functional modular hypothesis which divides the, the skull and neurocranium, snout and suspensorium. 
So I could test the support in my species for each of these uh, modularity hypotheses. So these are the results. They are matrix correlations between my theoretical matrix constructed from the hypothesis and the empirical matrices from the species. This is only for correlation matrices. And here you have the values of these matrix correlations. And the significance level are these lines. So above the line, it's significant. You have support for the hypothesis. So you can see for the developmental hypothesis, you have mostly support for the branchial module, but it's actually composed of only two bones. And that's a very good hypothesis to test modularity. This is what we could do. So uh, and the total hypothesis, which is the one who joins all these models, actually is at very low support. For the hormonal hypothesis, um, TH sensitive has some support, um, and sensitive not that much, and some good support for total hormonal hypothesis joining these two models together, right? And for the functional hypothesis, we have very nice support. So neurocranium, all species present neurocranium, all species, almost all species present the SNAP model, suspensorial so not that supported, and the total hypothesis is very highly supported in all species, including the outgroup. So from here, I would say that hormonal and functional hypothesis are the best supported, especially the functional hypothesis. So to explain this, this kind of results, uh, we have to think about the autogeny in the toads, which is different, right? So first, I want to uh, talk about uh, a model proposed in mammals from my group of my collaborators. It's the Palimpsest model, who says that you have uh, different processes going on in different timings in the autogeny, and all of them produce covariation among bones. And these covariations get overridden on time in autogeny. And in the adults, well, you have, you have a mix of all these covariation patterns that overlay among themselves. So this model brings us the question, which process that produce covariation can we capture by measuring adult toad skulls? This is what I measured. So, the toads have a two-phase ontogeny. So what we are proposing here is that in the aquatic phase where you have the embryos and the tadpoles, you have the cranial neural crest migration. And with metamorphosis, the signal actually gets kind of erased from the adult cranial. So I cannot capture this sign from the developmental modularity. But what actually can I capture is a sign that comes from hormonal regulation in metamorphosis, and especially in the terrestrial phase, which you still have uh, the cranial uh, ossifying and you have muscle bone interactions, you still have somatic growth, and here's which I get, I get really strong sign of functional modularity. So it's quite a big difference from mammals. You have this two phase and you have different signs to get capture modularity when you measure the adult toads. Okay, so we saw the matrix stability on the species, but the matrices are not identical. So I finally got to climate in the climate session. So um, now we're going to explore the differences in pea matrices. So two factors that could be related to that are phylogeny and climate. So fortunately this year we have a molecular phylogeny for the Hymenoglobulosa species group. And from this I can calculate phylogenetic distances between the species. And also it's a very interesting group to explore climatic differences because they have a wide distribution in South America and Central America capturing some more um, arid habitats and some more humid habitats. <laughs> so we extracted uh, bioclimatic variables from all the distribution range of the species, and I could calculate multivariate distance and climate between the species, all right? So the questions I'm trying to answer are, are closely related species, do closely related species have more similar P matrices? And the second one, species in more similar climates have more similar P matrices. So here are the results. Um, so the, uh, each dot is a pairwise similarity and phylogenetic distance. And you can see for covariance and correlation matrices, we don't have a relation between P matrix similarity and phylogenetic distances. On the other hand, for uh, climatic distance, we have a really strong relationship. So differences in covariance and correlation patterns are being structured by differences in climate. So this is a very uh, interesting thing. But where are the differences in P matrices, right? I only, I only showed you the overall similarity. So to respond to this, to, to uh, investigate this question, we use selection response decomposition. It's the same basic scheme that I explained. 
but we unfold the response vectors into trait-specific response vectors. So what I'm going to compare in this uh, method is trait-specific similarity between a pair of species, right? So for trait 1, trait 2, all the way to trait 21. And what I'm actually going to show is what I call SRD difference, which is the overall, the difference between overall similarity considering all characters and the trait-specific similarity, right? So this is going to give me where the divergence is happening across the species. So um, here is a cross species mean SRD diff. The line is in zero, meaning that uh, the trait similarity is similar to the overall similarity. So what interests me is the negative values because it's showing that trait similarity is actually below overall similarity. So we can see that we have five di distances that had uh, some differences in overall similarity, and four of them are concentrated in the snout model. So I can tell you that the differences in P matrices in toads in this species are concentrated in the snout. What about climatic differences? Uh, what we did, we created a climatic variance covariance matrices in log scale. We extracted a principal component axis and we projected the, the species means on these axes. So this is climatic PC1, climatic PC2. <coughs> But I want to focus on climatic PC1 here because it's only related to rain patterns. There's no component of temperature in this climatic axis. So the species differ quite a lot in their, uh, in their distribution of the rain patterns. So there are species that are in more rain in the dry months and less rain variation. And there are species that are in less rain in the dry season and more rain variation. So, this is just a map to confirm this. So this is the rain in the dry season, uh, and you have the colors for less rain and more rain. And you can see these are open habitat toads. So they are not actually very much distributed in places where you have a lot of rain, uh, in the dry season especially. But you have a difference in the species that are, are in places that should have more rain and species that are in places that should have less rain, right? So. Um, to wrap up, we need to connect now the snout, which I can see there are differences among species, and uh, rain patterns. So we take a look at the literature to see what, it, what is about snout function that we could relate to rain patterns. So um, I actually found, whoa, I actually found, found a quite interesting uh, paper that is saying that only after metamorphosis there's a development of uh, olfactory epithelium, which they call a new olfactory epithelium, not existed in the tadpoles. So this is the external nerves, and these are uh, the nasal cavity and the new olfactory epithelium. And it's, it is related to the detection of waterborne odors in juvenile and adults. And the authors suggested that this epithelium might be quite important when the species go back to reproduce in the water, right? So they can smell in the water. So we can uh, make a speculation here based on the ecology of the species and the snout function and the rain pattern. So we can wrap up. So uh, in other than lots of species groups, they are ground dwellers. They stay in holes. They stay on, under rocks, especially in the dry season. And when you get to the rain season, they come out of the holes, and they have to detect the, to detect ephemeral pools to reproduce. So. Snout might be quite related to this time point in which they had to find the, the ephemeral pools and reproduce and probably to detect the quality of the waters they're going to reproduce. So to conclude, relation among skull traits in toads is structured by functional interactions, probably connected to the terrestrial phase. Toad species differ in snout trait variations and difference in beam matrices are associated to difference in climate, special rain patterns. And snout function is related to the detection of waterborne odors and may be related to the ability of detecting ephemeral pools for reproduction. So thank you very much, and I want to thank my advisor, people from my lab, and all the museums that lend me specimens. Thank you.